Thank you so much. They, they got us because we're going we're gonna to use that again this week to go a little further. Um, so we've been in a series we started last week called March. Let's turn that the other way around. Forward what? All right, let's try it that way. I mean, you can go either way with it, right? Okay. So we decided to take the military term that they use sometimes when it's time to, to get moving, not just standing in place, but it's time to get, to get moving, right? Forward march. And uh, last week we talked about, God, where are you? How I many know we ask those questions sometimes? God, where are you? How I many know that we don't always know or understand why we have to go through what we go through, right? So we might got, ask God, where are you in the middle of all this? But we're going to continue on in week two. I've called this week, when you're in the dip. When you're in the dip. I'll show you the dip here. For those of you who weren't with us last week, we'll catch you up real quickly. But let me do something real quickly before I do that. I object, Your Honor. I object, Your Honor. Have you ever wanted to say that in a courtroom? Am I the only one that's ever wanted to be the guy to say that in the, in the courtroom? Like be crazy and mess around. And, but, you know, in this book of Habakkuk that we've been in, we started chapter 1 last week. We're going to get into chapter 2 this week. Really, that's what Habakkuk was saying to God when he found out the news of what God was trying to tell him he had to tell his people. He was going, wait a minute, huh? wait, wait, God. You're going to do what? And you're going to use who to do it with? I mean, you're going to take, I know we're evil, but you're going to take an even, a even more evil people to, to destroy us? He's going, wait a minute, hold, huh? I object. Have you ever objected to something God was telling you? Oh, you've just been perfect your whole life. I can see. <laughs> You totally understood everything that you felt like God was doing in your life. And so Habakkuk is a little bit in this situation. In chapter 1, we understood a little bit of the history of what was going on. It was violent times. It was corrupt times. Uh, there was just all kinds of evil that was breaking out. And it was God's people that was a part of it that was doing it. And so in that time, God, God said, look, I'm going to do some things. I'm going to change some things around. I'm going to use the people to... To help destroy my people. Hmm. And Habakkuk didn't know what to do with that. He didn't like that. He didn't want to be the messenger of that. And he was all right. And last week we understood that God's all right with, that, with us uh, asking questions. How I many know he can handle all the questions we got for him? He's big enough. He's all right with it. You don't have to think it. he's so high and mighty that he's going to knock you down because you're questioning things. Mm -mm. He's a personal God. He's a relatable God. He wants you to, he's all right with your questions in other words. And so Habakkuk had some questions, and we found out that a lot of the times and the things that they were going through back then, we're still dealing with a lot of our culture isn't that different now than what it was back then. We're dealing with some things like they were, some violent times, some corrupt times, some evil times that we're living in as well. And so we found out that we could apply a lot of that stuff to our day and age and what we're living in as well. So Habakkuk is one of the, let me, let me just catch you up history-wise. Let me catch us everybody up from chapter 1. We're going to chapter 2 now. History-wise, um, scholars called this book one of the minor prophets. And we understood that one of the minor prophets uh, doesn't mean that it's minor in message. It's just, it only, so Habakkuk only has three chapters. You could read the whole book in a day if you wanted to. And in probably 30 minutes, you could read the whole book of Habakkuk. It's only three chapters. And out of the 12 minor prophets, I don't really like giving them that name, but they give them that name because of the size of each book. Uh, I felt, man, I had a lot of people. I had an email. I had somebody on social media. I had some people come up to me face to face. They said they've never heard anybody preach out of the book of Habakkuk, which got me thinking of how much I might need to look into those minor prophets and how often we just look them over. But I want to let you know, even though we consider them minor because of the size of the volume, they really have a major message that we need to take away from each one. How many know God's got a purpose for every book that he's put in that Bible? He's got a purpose for it. 
And so we need to understand if we don't know what the purpose is, it, now we got an adventure. We got sort of something to look into to find out why God has actually put that in there, in its place. What's the purpose behind it? And we're learning that from Habakkuk right now, those sort of things. So it was written in 600 B.C. that 600 years before Christ was born. That's a long time, right? Now, we thought Christ had been born 2,000 years ago. That's 600 years before that. So we're talking way back in the way backs, right? A lot of stuff happening in that day and age. And when he said he was going to use the Babylonians and evil people, Habakkuk said, huh, wait a minute. I object. Now, we understand that Habakkuk, his name means what? Look, if you weren't here last week, understand my handwriting is no good. But I'm going to do it anyway, y'all all right? Y'all will learn to read my stuff, okay? His name means to embrace or to somebody said it. Somebody listened from last week. means to what? means to wrestle. To wrestle, to hold on. Once I get a hold of you, once I embrace you, guess what? I'm not letting go. And that's a... Uh, that's a great name for what this book represents. Now, we learned last week. Let me do this real quickly with you. We learned last week. What do we got? This is our, this is our chart we used last week. Mr. Godin, or Godin, I should say, Seth Godin, he came up with the, with the graph itself, but we used it. I put my own things on it. I'll put it that way, okay? And we found out that each one of us, as we got into life, we started somewhere on this chart, right? And we said down here, we don't even know the Lord. We don't even have a relationship with Him. But one day, as that song we sang at the end, have you come to the end of yourself? One day, you come to the end of yourself and you go, all right, God, I can't get this done on my own. I need to give up myself and all my selfishness and living for myself. And one day, by God's grace and mercy, we give our heart to Christ. And we go, all right, God, I'm going to live for you from this day forward. And what happens is, is we live for Christ, man, and we're all wrapped up in it, right? Right? We're all wrapped up in Christ. And here's the examples I use just, just to catch you up. I won't give it all because we had some stuff filled out here from last week, but I can't go all into that. But what I'll do is catch us on the quick version real quickly. So we said that, man, when we gave our life to Christ, every time we came to church, man, when we first started out, we felt like the message was just for me. God is speaking to me every time I go there, right? Man, and... When I get in the car, when I'm leaving church, I get in the car, man, my favorite song is on the radio every time. And boy, when I go to Walmart, that front space was open. Woo, I knew God was in that because every other time I go to Walmart, I had to. And man, everything I prayed for, God began to just answer my prayers and things were just so good when I first gave my heart to what? To Christ, Right? But all of a sudden, one day, one day I came to church and that message sort of messed me up a little bit. And I thought, hmm, that's kind of weird. And then I got in the car and it wasn't my favorite song on the radio. And I went to Walmart and don't you know I had to park all the way in the back. And then I started praying for some things, and man, God won't answer my prayer the way I wanted him to answer it. He just won't. And somebody loved one of mine got sick, and I didn't understand that. I got in a car accident, and man, things just didn't work out the way, and you found yourself in what Henry Blackaby, the author, called, well, we, we noted it as C.B., Crisis of belief, right? Crisis of belief. We found ourselves no longer on top of the mountain. We found ourselves going down a little bit, and we didn't understand all of it, right? 
And we told our, we, we, we found out that we, there was basically around three options that once we got to this point that most people go through. They can choose, right? You got a choice when you get here. I mean, you ain't got much choice when you get here. Everything's good. But when you get to here, you got a choice to make. And that crisis of belief, CB, right? When you get here, most people decide to do what? I'm going to circle back around. I call this the stick your head in the sand syndrome or the ostrich syndrome, right? Where you don't accept what it is that's going on and you just go right back to here going, I'm just going to live up here in euphoria in la-la land. I'm just going to stay. And some people will be, they'll use faith. Hey, I'm just going to have faith. But don't you know right here, you've asked God and God's told you to do something right here. You ain't like what you heard right there, so you, it's not real faith, but you ain't listening to God. The doctor told you to do something right here. A financial advisor told you to do something right here. You didn't do it. Oh, no, I'm just going to trust God. I'm going right back to, there are some people that are so super spiritual, they live right here and never get to, hmm. The other option is some people decide when they get right here, boy, it ain't going the way I thought it was going. Man, I thought this whole life was going to be just for me. I thought when I gave my heart to Christ that it was going to make me happy, and I know God just wants me happy. And now that I'm not happy, I'm going back to what? I'm going back to the way it used to be. I'm going to go back to living for myself. He ain't giving me what I want. Why, why I go through all this and, and I ain't getting what I want out of it? I know this is about me. And we choose to go back. A lot of young Christians go back. They go through this and they get here. They're all hyped. And then when they start facing a little adversity, guess what? They choose to what? Go right back to the beginning again. What's it worth? Right? But then you got one more option. This is last week, we're catching up from last week, y'all all right? One more option is I can continue to what? I believe right here, this is where we hear God say, forward, march, right? And I go through a season where I'm having faith in God. I'm having faith in God. But nothing's getting better. Matter of fact, it might start getting a little what? <laughs> you ever pray to God and it didn't get better right away? God, what in the world? But you're still having faith. Matter of fact, we used James chapter 1 last week as the example of this. It said, consider it pure joy, my brothers, my sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your what? Faith produces perseverance. And perseverance must finish its what? Its work so that you may be what? Mature and complete, not lacking anything. So that you may be what? I'm going to write mature and complete, right? That's where we're trying to get to right here, right? Mature and complete, not lacking anything. So we got a choice to make. Mm -hmm. We said chapter 1. Chapter 1 last week was about wandering. Right? Wandering. He was wondering what God was doing. He was questioning God. He had a lot of things going on in his mind. Now look, we had a lot more stuff filled out here. We're going to get there, but we're going to go beyond here today. What do you do when you're in the dip? There was a, oh, I was thinking about this situation. And there was a, there was an old hymn that popped into my mind when I was thinking about the stuff for today. And maybe you didn't grow up in church or you didn't grow up on hymns, so no big deal if you didn't know this. I'll catch you up real quickly. But one of the old hymns I remember as I grew up, the title of it was Blessed Assurance. Right? Blessed Assurance. Let me give you a little bit. Of that. I got the lyrics right here to it. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. 
Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. Here's the chorus. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. It repeated itself. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. How many know you can't have a story? Till you go through the dip. <laughs> and until you go through the dip, when you come up here, you can go back and go, this is my story. This is my song. I'm praising my Savior all the day long. You catching it? The lady that wrote that song her name was Frances Crosby, or Franny Crosby. She wrote that song back in 1858. She was born in 1820. That's a long time ago, right? And she wrote a song that said, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. I want to tell you today, you get your story in the dip. You get your story in the dip. I'll come back to her at the end in just a little bit. What do you do when you're in the dip? That's my question for you today. What do you do when you're in the dip? I want to read Habakkuk chapter 2. I want to read the first three verses in Habakkuk chapter 2 with you real quickly. It says, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will stand at my watch, one, and I will station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. Verse 2, then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that the herald may run with it. Verse 3, for the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not, what? It will not delay. I'll start, we'll go a little further into this chapter 2 here in just a little bit. So what do you do when you're in the dip? What do you do when you're in the dip? Hmm. Hmm. When you've asked God, you've questioned God, you believe, God, I don't understand, God, what's going on, but what do you do when you get there? Let me tell you, the first thing you need to do is you need to listen. Listen, I'm going to give you three things, and I'm gonna, uh, I'm, before I fill out the rest of this chart, let me give you the three things before I fill out the rest of it, okay? First thing you got to do is listen. Stop and what? Listen. Habakkuk was saying, God, I don't like what you're doing. I've stated my case, and I've gave you all the scenarios. I, I don't like the answers you're giving me back. Have you ever tried to, like, List stuff and, and prove a case to God of why you want it the way you want it. <laughs> God, I've done, done this and I've read the word and I've proclaimed this and I've asked about this. I know you want it this way, God. And boy, we'll come up with the evidence and present to Him. Hmm? But sometimes we just need to stop and what? Listen. <laughs> just stop and. And listen, hmm. you see, oftentimes we like to we like to run around real busy. Most of the time, we like to just come and whine to God a little bit. God, this is what's happening. We like to get our cry out and our whine real quick, and then we go right about right back to our business, our everyday life. Just go running, doing our thing. And God's going, wait a minute, will you just, will you just stop? Would you be still? If you'll just be still for one second, have you ever had to tell your child, shh? <laughs> shh, but God, shh. But mama, mama, daddy, daddy, this, if you would just be quiet for two seconds, child, I will... I will tell you what you're trying to get. If you'll just stop and listen. 
Just stop what? If you just stop talking, you might be able to hear what I've been trying to tell you. Hmm? How many know God says that stuff to us more times than not? Because we live in a world that wants to stay busy, full of fast-pacedness. We want it instant, and we want it right now. We don't want to stop and what? Listen, we want to talk and tell our side, and then we want to go do what we want to do. And God, in his kingdom, how many know that's the opposite of the society that we live in? How many know fast food restaurants aren't going out of business? Matter of fact, they're gaining. Why? Because we want it right now. Society tells us, why are these things so popular and growing in popularity? Because we got everything at our fingertips when we want it, how we want it, right what? Right now. We do not like to stop and what? Listen. And he said, look, I had to get up into my watch to hear what he had to say. I mean, God's got plenty to say, but he'll never force it upon you. He'll let you go to the end of yourself. And once you're there, if you're willing to stop, I mean, no, he's ready to talk. He'll give you everything you need to know. You got to stop and what? Listen. Did I read that second verse again? That second 2 1. Did I read that one already with you? Let me read that one with you real quick. I will watch to see what he will say to me and how I will answer my reproof, how I will answer and what he will say to me. I mean, know God's relational. He's real relational. He'll allow us to ask all the questions in the world, and then we'll, we'll try to talk and tell him. And, but in a relationship, how many know you need it to go both ways? How many of you are not in much of a relationship if you're the one doing all the talking and asking? So he wants us to stop. What do you do when you're in the dip? You've got to stop and what? Listen, the second thing you got to do is you got to write, you got to write it down. You need to write down what God is telling you. When you stop and listen and he begins to speak to you, guess what you need to do? You need to write it down. Let me show you this. Habakkuk 2 verse 2. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets. Here's why. So that a herald may run with it. So that somebody can take it beyond where you're at. You can't speak to everybody, but if I write it down and give it, I mean, I can make copies of that thing, and it can go wherever I need it to go. Hmm. That's one avenue about writing it down. I believe another avenue of why God wanted him to write it down was so that years later, when I prove myself, I'm a just and true God, and I prove myself that I've done that, that you can look back on what I told you because it's all come to pass now. I got proof that what I said will come what? To pass. I'm going to write it down. Hmm. I'm going to write it down. How many of God's got a lot to say? How many of sometimes when I finally stop and listen and he tells me something, if I don't write it down and I wait a day, if I wait a week, if I wait two weeks, a month from now, how many know if I don't write it down, how many know the enemy can come in and he can go, hey, he ain't really say that. That ain't what he meant. But if I've wrote it down, guess what I can do? In that moment, when the enemy tries to come in and put seeds of doubt and inferiority and insecurity into what God has said over my life. What I heard him say to me in the times that I stopped and listened and I wrote it down. When I wrote it down, then I can go back and I can open that thing up and go, guess what? I can tell the enemy, this is what God said and I can read it right off. And not only am I telling him, but guess who else gets to find that out? I get to tell myself that. I get to know what God said, right? In other words, 
It's not just God's written word in the Bible. How many know now that I've wrote it down, what he said to me becomes his written word to me in the day and age I'm living in? And you got something authentic right in front of you. And you can refer to that when you're in the what? (laughs) When you're in the dip and you need to extend faith, you've got something that you can look back on and go, look, when I was here, this is what God was speaking to me. And now that he's got me here, I know he's still speaking. And when I got to here, I'm looking back to what he said here. And so I got constant understanding of what God said because of what I what? Wrote down when I stilled myself and was what? Listening to what he had to tell me. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that God will speak to you. He will speak to you. Look, now, I've never heard God audibly speak to me out loud. Never heard that. I've heard some people that have. I believe God can. Matter of fact, he did it in the Bible days. He spoke over Jesus. This is my beloved son. Everybody heard it. In whom I am well pleased when he was being baptized by John the Baptist, right? He spoke to others. Paul, who who were killing Christians, he got knocked off his beast on his way to Damascus, and Jesus was right in front of him, and he heard an audible voice. Sometimes God will speak that way. I haven't heard it yet, but sometimes God will. Let me tell you how else God speaks to you. God will speak to you through his written word. If you go right to, I wonder what God's trying to say about this. If you'll just open the word, he'll speak to you about it. Many, many times your answers will be right in something he's already given us. But a lot of times we won't take the time to hide his word in our hearts. I mean, he gives us a responsibility to do that. Look, I've been telling you this the whole time. If you just look right here, I got all your answers. There's other ways that God speaks to us too. I found this out. I mean, sometimes he'll speak through, like, situations or circumstances or scenarios that come about. You've been praying for God to do something, and you've seen God move through something. God healed you, touched your body. Somebody helped you financially when they didn't know any way out about it. They didn't know what you were going through. Just out of the situations, all the circumstances, you're going, man, that had to be God. Man, that marriage that was not going well, and God has made it last all this time, and they're doing well now, that had to be God. That child that hadn't been living for the Lord, that has come back to a relationship with Christ, man, I know that had to be God. So God will speak to you through what? Situations and circumstances that you'll watch develop over time in your life. God will also speak to you, not just through audible words or his word or through circumstances, how many know he'll speak to you through people as well? He'll use people. You'll be praying to God over something, and you ain't told nobody about it. And all of a sudden, somebody will come up to you and say something, and they didn't. And you go, "Wait a minute, who told you?" Or maybe they don't even know what it is that you're going through, but you just prayed a certain prayer or a certain phrase, and somebody throughout the circumstances of the day, you just do in everyday life, they'll speak something, and you'll go, uh-oh. You know, God's, God's using them to say something to me. I can see that already. He'll use people to speak to you. Circumstances. He'll use his word. And God will speak to you himself if you'll stop and what? You'll stop and listen. Let me give you one more thing you do when you're in the dip. When you're in the dip. Because this area that we are talking about today is this area right here we call the dip, right? (laughs) We don't like that too much. But many of us find ourselves there throughout the journey of life that we face. Not only do we stop and listen when we're in the dip and do you write it down when you hear him speak to you, but the last thing is, is you got to wait. You got to wait. You got to wait. <laughs> what did I say you got to do? You got to wait.
Awkward, isn't it? I mean, just waiting 20 seconds made us feel a little what? Awkward. Because our society tells us the exact opposite. It tells us that we have to have it right now. Don't stop and listen. Don't stop to write it down. Don't wait on nothing. But God's kingdom is built. Our faith is proven in the waiting. Nothing else back there for you. This period is the waiting period. The dip that you're going through, that's the waiting period. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall walk and not grow weary. They shall run and not faint. Teach me, Lord, to what? Teach me, Lord, to wait. Hmm. Wait, man, we don't like waiting. (laughs) But here's what Habakkuk 2 verse 3 says. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. The revelation awaits. Revelation what? It awaits an appointed time. We'll come back to that phrase in just a moment in the original language. The revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of an end and will not prove false. It speaks of a... End and will not prove what? False. Though it linger. What's the next verse? What's it say? Are you with me back there? Switch it up for me. There we go. He was waiting. <laughs> Another visual for you, right? For the vision awaits a point in time, it testifies of an end. It will not lie. My translation says it will not linger. Or though it linger, it says to do what? Here we go. Wait for it. Wait for it. Hmm. It will certainly come and will not delay. Hmm. It will surely come. It will certainly come. It will not what? So in other words, when God promises you something, how many of you can take it to the bank? If he promised it to you, you can take it to the bank. If you... If you stopped and listened and you wrote it down and he spoke it to you from God, how many know that you can take it to the bank? It will come to pass. It will. Though it linger in this waiting period, right? Though it linger, wait for it. Wait. Wait for it. (laughs) Just wait for it. You know what we did? At, we just had uh, a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, we had uh, our team leaders meeting together. And uh, so our leadership came together and we began to do some things. How many know that in just a few weeks, it's, uh, a month or so, it's going to be Easter? Hmm? And you're going to hear us talk more about that here in, in just the next coming weeks because we believe God's called us to do some things. And we began to write some things down. We were trying to what? Stop and listen, and when we listened, we started to what? We wrote some things down, right? You're going to hear about some of those things in the next coming weeks, but I'm going to just give you one for example, okay? So we said, what, what do you feel like God's calling us? What's the goal we can set to reach people for Christ on Easter Sunday? Because for whatever reason, that's an opportunity where people's hearts are what? They're open. People that don't ever show up, they're going to show up when? Easter Sunday, Right? So we're trying to prepare for that. And we're glad they do. We're not mad at them. We, we want to love on them the best we can when we get there, right? And we want you to be a part of that. You're going to help us invite. So I asked them, I said, what's a goal for us to set for Easter Sunday? How many people can we affect for the kingdom of Christ on Easter Sunday? Somebody said 400. Somebody said 500. So guess what I did? I shot right in the middle. I said, all right. 450. We're going to shoot for that goal. And I wrote it what? 
And then from that, God, how are we going to do this? How are we going to get to it? How are we going to accomplish what we feel like you've called us to? How are we going to get there? In the next few weeks, you're going to hear a lot about how we're going to get to here. Because we're going to have the faith to get it there, right? You got to what? You got to listen. You got to what? Write it down. And then you are waiting. You're waiting. (laughs) Some of you right now, today, some of you are in the waiting zone right now. God's dealing with your heart. You don't understand. You got a lot of questions and things are going on and you are just waiting on the Lord. And you don't like it. It's not comfortable. But God's showing you something. He's beginning to do some things. God, I've listened. I've recorded it, God. I wrote it down. God, what are you doing? But I want to tell you something. When you're in this period, I want you to know that God's delays are not his denials. Mm -hmm. God's delays in the waiting period. You don't feel like he's doing anything, but guess what? God's delays is not necessarily a denial. Let me ask you this way. I didn't even give this one in the first service. This is an extra one just for y'all. Y'all ready? When you go to a restaurant, there's somebody that comes to your table. You call them a waiter, right? A waiter, as they're waiting on you, are they standing still? No, a waiter's what? In other words, they're still serving while they're waiting. So in other words, what are you to do while you're in the waiting period? I'm going to just give up? I'm going to go back? Mm -mm. You got to, God, I don't like this, and I don't see what you're doing in it, but I'm going to keep serving you. I'm going to grab hold. I'm going to serve in what you've called me to serve on Sunday mornings. I'm going to keep serving the people at work. I'm going to keep serving my family. I'm going to keep serving while I'm waiting, God. I'm going to keep what? I'm not going to give up on you. I'm going to keep serving. It will surely come to pass. <laughs> you know, throughout the Bible, the Bible gives us several examples of God's promise to people, and then they had to wait on it. Take, for instance, Moses. Moses, God told him, hey, you're going to set my people free. You're going to be my deliverer. You're going to bring them into the promised land, right? Moses said, all right, great. And Moses got them, boy, they went through the Red Sea on dry land. They got to the other side, and they thought they was going to walk right into the promised land. But guess what they had to do? (laughs) Here they are. Forty years they had to what? You know what? Moses didn't even see the promised land. Hmm? There was a guy by the name of Joseph. Young man, young, youngest of all his brothers, he had a dream. In the dream, he saw his brothers bowing down to him. In other words, he was going to be a leader. His brothers didn't like that dream. I mean, you know, sometimes your family members won't even like what God told you. <laughs> so what do you do, right? So what they do, they took off and put him in a pit. And once they put him in a pit, they sold him to slavery. In that slavery, he got falsely accused. He got put in jail years into slavery. He spent two years in jail. The Pharaoh had a dream. They called him up. He interpreted the dream. Won't you know it a year or two later? Guess what he's doing? He's in charge of the whole land, second in command to Pharaoh. How many know he didn't step right out the pit, go right to Pharaoh? Guess what he had to do? There's a guy by the name of Paul. His name was Saul before God took him off the beast. He was killing Christians, right? Remember this guy we talked about already? And on his way, Christ came to him, blinded him for a little bit, right? But Christ put in his heart that you're going to be, you're going to be the apostle Paul. You're going you're to preach my word. You're going to carry my gospel all over the place. You're gonna, I'm, I'm calling you to preach my word. Do you know it was 13 years later? Before Paul ever preached his first sermon to anybody? You thought Paul just came off and was all good. Off. Do you know that once he uh, got knocked off that he had to go where God called him to go and there was a man waiting on him that God had sent. His name was Barnabas. And guess what Barnabas did? 
Barnabas taught him and ruffled his feathers for 13 years before he ever. See, you thought when God told you something right here that you were just going to go to right here. You see, but we don't like having to go through this period and then we got to do what? But in the waiting period, understand God is preparing me for what he's prepared for me. You catching it? He's preparing me in the waiting season for what he's already prepared for me. But if we'll never go through this, some of us stay here and never fulfill the purpose of what God had for us. Never becoming mature and complete because we weren't willing to go through what God had called us to go through. We like to stay selfish. We like to make it about us rather than revealing that, hey, God, I can't do this in me anymore. I got to have you. And God begins to purify us. He begins to, to do some things in us to, to make us, we got to decrease so that he can what? Increase. So we don't like the waiting season. We don't like that at all. I used to hate waiting season when I was a little kid, when I was a child. Anybody ever had a mama that used to say, when your daddy gets home? See, I used to hate that part. Because then I'd have to be anxious like all day waiting for daddy to come home. You know what I mean? Like, I, I wish she'd just go ahead and take care of herself. Let's just get it over with, right? Hmm? That's what Habakkuk was going through just a little bit. There's a word that's called, I'm going to get to that point here. There's a word that's called the appointed time, right? We read that phrase, the appointed time. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come to pass, right? That word, appointed time, is actually one word in the original language. It's called Moad, M-O-W-E-D, Moad. And it does mean an appointed time, an appointment, but it also means a fixed time. So in other words, if we're willing to go through the waiting season, God's got an appointed time that that thing will mature and come to pass, right? But if it's God's appointed time, how many know there's nothing you or anybody else can do to speed it up or to slow it down? It's going to be at his appointed time. Hmm? So many times we want God to do it when? Right now. But he's got a, an appointed time. and You still got to go through your waiting season to get there, right? <laughs> an appointed time. Can I read this in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3? I'm going to read this in the Living Bible. I think I have that translation up there. It says, but these things I plan won't happen right away. I want you to catch this other version, how it breaks it down a little bit. Slowly, steadily, surely, the time approaches. When? Not fast, not right now, not right when I want it, but what? Slowly, steadily, slowly, steadily. Surely, even when it feels like I got to go uphill, surely the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. It, if it seems slow, do not what? Despair. Do not despair. For these things will surely come to pass. Just be what? Man, we don't like that word. Mm -mm. Just be what? Patient. They will not be overdue a single day. It would be God's appointed time to us. <laughs> In other words, God is saying to Habakkuk, I believe this. Don't worry. Daddy's coming home. You wait till your daddy comes home. I believe God's telling Habakkuk, don't worry. Father God's going to take care of all this. Those evil people that are doing this evil, they got an appointed time too. And I'm using them to prepare you for what I've prepared for you. But their day will come where I will take them out too. I will wipe them off the face of the earth. They got an appointed time. Just like when my daddy would come home and have me an appointed time. 
because of how I might have talked back to mama or I acted during school or did something that I wasn't supposed to do. I know God's got an appointed time too. Let me read you one more at the end of that verse. Or let me go to the start of verse 4. Habakkuk 2 verse 4 says, See the enemy. The enemy being who? Babylon, right? See Babylon. The enemy is puffed up. It's what? Puffed up. Did you know the Bible even had that word puffed up in it? Here it is, right here. See, the enemy, Babylon, is puffed up. His desires are not upright. I'm going to stop right, right there. In other words, they're not heeding God's rules. They think they got it all figured out. They think that, that nobody can tell them anything. The word puffed up is the opposite of humbleness and wisdom is what it is. It's somebody that's full of pride. And we know that pride comes before the the fall, a haughty spirit before destruction is what his word says. And so these people are puffed up. They're full of pride. You can't tell them nothing. That sounds a lot like our society today. People that don't want to follow God's word, they feel like they got it all figured out. They're puffed up. You can't tell them nothing. I don't care what God's word says. If it feels good, I'm going to just do it. Well, society says it's this way. And if I don't do it their way, some people might look down on me. I might have to go against the stream. They call that countercultural, right? So I might not be able to line up with everything culture is telling me because if God's word tells me one thing, then I got to make a decision right here which way I'm going to go. Am I going to take the heat and follow him? Because how many know that a lot of times in this faith journey he's called us to while we're waiting in this dip, it's going to take faith. But you can't go by what you see during this period. you got to go by what God's already told you. And you wrote it down. Because we walk by faith and not by sight, right? That's what his word says. Let me get real quickly. Let me finish this up. The seven woes. Chuck, come on, help me. I'm going to try to finish this out real quickly. Here's the five woes, not seven. Here's the five woes to Babylon. I want to say these real quickly because I won't read each verse. I'll just reference the verse. This is throughout the rest of uh, chapter two real quickly. It says, woe to him. Each one of these start out and say, woe to him. And what they're saying is, is woe to Babylon. Woe to these people that continue to be puffed up and want to follow their way instead of God's way. These people are the same people that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when God's people got taken into captivity by them, they wanted them to bow down before the idol, and they wouldn't bow, right? That's the same people. So you see where they're coming from, and God's saying, look, woe to you. Here's what he says, Habakkuk 2, verse 6. Woe to him who piles up stolen goods, because they were squandering and taking everything from everybody, right? Woe to him, Habakkuk 2, 9. Woe to him who builds his realm by unjust gain. Habakkuk 2, verse 12. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed. For all the partiers that were in that group, Habakkuk 2, verse 15. Woe to him who gives drinks to his neighbors. Read the rest of that. You'll know why. Habakkuk 2, verse 19, the last one. Woe to him who says to wood or to stone. Basically the object. Remember they bow down to the idols that were made of stone or wood or metal. Woe to him who says to wood or stone, come to life. Many people believe that this verse 4 is the key verse for the whole book of Habakkuk. Here it is in its entirety. All of verse 4 says this. See the enemy, Babylon, is puffed up. His desires are not upright. But the righteous will live by his faithfulness. Or the King James or the New King James, when I memorized this verse growing up, it said the righteous will live by faith. The righteous will live by what? Faith. The righteous will live by faith. Not by what we see, not by what's going on around us, but we're going to live by faith. Faith in what God said. When he spoke, I was trying to what? I stopped to 
to listen. And when I, I listened, I recorded it. I wrote it down. And now I'm trying to wait on God until he fulfills his promises, his purposes in my life. I'm waiting on him. And so by waiting, we believe that we are found righteous because we are waiting on God to fulfill his purpose and plan in our lives. How many know that Hebrews chapter 11, we call that the faith chapter, and there there's many examples of people who had to wait, and then God moved on their behalf, and they seen it come to pass, and they said it was because of their faith, their righteousness, and their faith. It was a credit to them of why these things came to pass. How many know the earth was formed by faith? I mean, there was a guy by the name of Noah who built the ark by faith, and everybody thought he was crazy. Huh? That guy Moses, that everybody thought was insane, God ended up making a way through the, through, through the water, the Red Sea, when there seemed to be no way. Right? There was a guy by the name of, of Abraham and Sarah, and they couldn't bear children. And they were, the Bible called them so old, they were beyond barren age. But they believed God. When they stopped to listen to God, they believed God told them, you're still going to have a child even though everybody else says there is no way. You don't even see a way. But you better go by what I tell you, not by what everybody else sees. In other words, you got to have faith while you're in the waiting period. And they had faith enough where God gave them a son. Matter of fact, God tried to test them again and said, go sacrifice that son. And when he got them to the mountain of sacrifice, there was some, something provided, a lamb in the thicket, in the bush. And God said, I just wanted to test your what? Huh? Man, that's a hard test. There's some of you today. Let's, let's apply it to our life today, right? There's some of us today. It might be a couple who's believed God for a child. And the doctors have told you you can't conceive. There's a problem. But you think that God told you that you're going you're gonna to have a child one day. You've prayed, you've listened, you've wrote it down, God spoke. So you're living by faith and not by what? Sight. <laughs> but maybe through the waiting period, God told you when you got to hear... Look, I want you to adopt a child. You know, I've seen this happen on three different scenarios at least that I can recall. I've, I've watched this happen. And because they listened to what God told them and adopted a child, do you know up here, a year later, guess what they had? They had a child. Three different times, people that couldn't have a child Listen to God, they adopted a child, and within a year later, guess what they had? Not just one child, now they got what? Two, because they got an adopted one and one that God gave them, their own. I've watched that happen three different times. God, that marriage I'm going through, everybody's telling me, woo, I need to get out and get divorced, but God, I'm not trying to listen to everybody else right now. God, I know I made these vows before you and to that other person. And I'm trying to see, God, are you telling me that I need to stick it out? If so, God, I believe you got a purpose in the pain and that you will accomplish that purpose in me. God, you can do a miracle that I can't do on my own. I mean, I can go scenario after scenario. How many know if God's going to accomplish anything to make you mature and complete, you're going to have to go through the waiting period. It's just God's design of how he grows us, how he tests us, how he prepares us. Mm -hmm. but what do you do when you continue to live by faith and you've come to the end of the road in your life and God hasn't given you what you've been believing for? Maybe you've seen some things happen, but he didn't give it to you in your lifetime. Moses, right? Moses, he took him across the Red Sea and he led him in the wilderness. Don't you know, he, he led him in the wilderness. He got him out of bondage. 
But he never got them to the promised land. He never did see that. I mean, know some things God will take you through and he'll give you some of it, but some of it won't for your time. It was for the next what? For the next generation to come. Hmm? Some things, I mean, know Habakkuk. There were some things that God told Habakkuk to write down and make it plain. And God did some things that he's seen in his day and age. But there were some things after Habakkuk was dead and gone that he'd never seen in his day and age. But guess what? The herald was still running and it still came to pass in the generations to come, right? Hmm? So what do you do when you're in the dip? And it hasn't come to pass in your day and age. Three words. Three words I want to give you real quickly. But the Lord. But the Lord. The last verse in Habakkuk chapter 2 says this. What's the first three words? <laughs> but the Lord in his holy temple is in his holy temple. But the Lord is in his holy temple. In other words, he's on the throne. He's in his rightful place. Hmm? Let all the earth be silent. What? Before him. Habakkuk, all the noise that everybody says going on while you're telling them this and they're having to wait, guess what? Don't worry. I am still on the throne. I'm in my holy temple. Don't listen to the noise. Continue to do what? Continue to wait. Continue to wait. But the Lord. Stand with me where you're at. I want to show you something real quickly. Stand with me right where you're at. You remember the lady... Franny Crosby, I mentioned to you at the beginning, who wrote Blessed Assurance, right? So let me give you a little backdrop before we pray together. Franny was born in 1820. When she was a baby, she developed a, a uh, eye, eye infection in both eyes. So a doctor came in, the article I read said a quack doctor because he didn't diagnose it correctly. So he took and put some hot sutures, some hot things, uh, materials over the eyes to try to take out the infection. And it did that. The purpose did that. But it was so hot, even though the infection went away, it burnt the eyes. So as the eyes were trying to heal itself, it began to scar and leave scars and all that. Don't you know she was blind from that day as a child? For the rest of her life, she couldn't see. It burnt the eyes so bad. She couldn't see. Do you know a few months after that incident, still a baby, her dad passed away. So mama had to try to pick up, start going to work. Grandmama came in and helped raise little Franny as mama was trying to bring money in so they could survive. So what did little Franny do? Grandmama began to instill some things and pray in her and do some things as she was sitting there with her. Don't you know, at 12 years old, she finally found that there was an institute, the New York Institute for the Blind. She went to school there, finished. Matter of fact, she came back to teach at that school for 23 years she taught at that school. She met her husband who went to that school. She met all kinds of friends her husband was actually a musical person, a composer, and very well at it. So they ran in those circles. She had a very good friend that grew up with her in that school that became a great musical composer. She came back to visit her one day in 1858. And she sat down at the piano, and she began to play something. And she said, Franny, what do you hear? Guess what Franny said? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. 
This is my song. You can't get to here until God gives you the story. And if you've praised him all the day long in the waiting period, how many know he'll get you to where you should be all along? Mature and complete, not lacking anything. They that wait on the Lord, he shall renew their strength. I want to pray that with you today. I want that to set with you because I wanted to drive something home in your life today. And maybe, Tommy, I need that to drive home right now. Come on, let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your purpose and your plan. God, I do believe that you got purpose in the pain and the waiting that we go through, God. You're trying to change us. You're trying to shape us. Tommy, I believe he's trying to shape me right now. I know to do that, I need to give him my life. Maybe I ran from him. Maybe when times started getting tough, I ran back to my original spot, not believing, living for myself. And I know today, I need to be able to wait on the Lord. I need to give him my life today. If that's you. You want me to pray that with you? You want to give your life to Christ? Just wave at me. Say, yeah, that's me, Tommy. That's me. Thank you. I see you. I appreciate you. Maybe you're one of those going, Tommy, I've given my life to Christ, but I am in the waiting period right now. I know week one, Tommy, we talked about wandering, but now we've moved on and I'm in the waiting period. And I need him to do something in me. I need to give me the, the strength. I need to give me the faith, the endurance. I need to, to make sure I'm learning and understanding and allowing him to develop me in the waiting period and not just complaining. Tommy, I need to stop and listen. I need to write it down. I need to wait on him. That's you. You want me to pray that with you today? I'm in the waiting period. Wave at me real quick. Say, yeah, that's me. That's me. Man, I, I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those hands. I appreciate you. I see you. We're going to believe that right now. Father, we thank you for your presence today. God, we thank you that you are preparing us, God, that you're working in us. God, let us not give up, God, in the waiting season. God, let us not get ahead of you and your appointed times in our life. God, let us be willing to wait on the Lord because you are going to renew our strength. God, we are mounting up. You're building us up on wings like eagles. God, we will run and not grow weary. We're going to walk and not faint. God, if, just teach us right now. Teach us to wait. God, prepare us. God, as only your Holy Spirit can prepare us right now. God, work in us right now. God, develop that faith because the righteous, we live by faith. God, we thank you that even though Miss Franny couldn't see it with her physical eye, God, that she could see it with her spiritual eye and you begin to grow her in faith. God, we want that same growth right now, that blessed assurance. Right now, God, that you are moving and working in us and we thank you, God, that you are doing just that. You're shaping us, you're growing us, and you got a purpose behind the waiting period, God. We thank you for it right now. And God, we thank you that you're growing us in it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You know, sometimes.